Welcome to The Alcove. I'm Mark Malero. My guest today is Naomi Klein. She is an acclaimed journalist, writer, and activist, perhaps best known for her best-selling book from the year 2000, No Logo, hailed by the New York Times as a movement bible of the anti-globalization movement. She's here today to discuss her new book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. As well, we have a clip of the short accompanying film to The Shock Doctrine by Children of Men filmmaker Alfonso Cuaron. Here's a look at that film. A collective trauma, a war, a coup, a natural disaster, a terrorist attack puts us all into a state of shock. And in the aftermath, like the prisoner in the interrogation chamber, we too become childlike, more inclined to follow leaders who claim to protect us. One person who understood this phenomenon early on was the most famous economist of our era, Milton Friedman. Friedman believed in a radical vision of society in which profit and the market drive every aspect of life, from schools to health care, even the army. He called for abolishing all trade protections, deregulating all prices, and eviscerating government services. These ideas have always been tremendously unpopular, and understandably so. They cause waves of unemployment, send prices soaring, and make life more precarious for millions. Unable to advance their agenda democratically, Friedman and his disciples were drawn to the power of shock. The subject should be rudely awakened and immediately blindfolded and handcuffed. When arrested at this time, most subjects experience intense feelings of shock, insecurity, and psychological stress. The idea is to prevent the subject from relaxing and recovering from shock. Friedman understood that just as prisoners are softened up for interrogation by the shock of their capture, massive disasters could serve to soften us up for his radical free market crusade. He advised politicians that immediately after a crisis, they should push through all the painful policies at once before people could regain their footing. He called this method economic shock treatment. I call it the shock doctrine. Welcome. Thank you. I was wondering if you give us an idea of uh, this term that you've coined, the shock doctrine. Where did you come up with this, and what does it mean economically in terms of, of shock therapy? Well, the shock doctrine is the term I'm using to describe a philosophy of power. And the philosophy is that if you want to push through economic shock therapy, uh, the free market, revolution, um, the best time to do it is in the aftermath of some other kind of shock, a shock that prepares the ground, that softens up a society, uh, disorients people. So that's the shock doctrine. The okay. first shock prepares the ground for the second shock, the economic shocks. Okay. And uh, in terms of the economist Milton Friedman, you talk about uh, essentially three decades of Friedman-esque kind of Chicago school economics that you know, were first applied in Chile and now are being applied in other parts of the West. Um, is this, in, in terms of it being an idea, is this an overarching idea? Is this a completely new idea that you're proposing? Um, well, what I'm doing with the book is providing an alternative history of the, our, our contemporary uh, economic era, the chapter we've been living for in the US since Reagan, okay. uh, in Latin America, uh, since the 70s, um, you know, it's th th this this revolution started in different parts of the world at different in different moments. In, in, in Eastern Europe, it was after the Berlin Wall fell, and and, yeah. and so you know the, the timing is different in different parts of the world. It did begin 35 years ago in Latin America. Uh, there's a broad agreement on this mm -hmm. and th that we have been living a new chapter, and that Milton Friedman is was the the guru. Of, of, of this chapter of history, of what, the, the tr what's often described as the triumph of the free markets. And mm -hmm. I think we've been living
living with a fairy tale version of how this economic model spread throughout the world. And there have been some, what I call the official stories. One of them was a PBS series called Commanding Heights, um, which was a, a, a three part series on the great battle between Hayek and Friedman and Keynes. Right. Uh, and, um, and so what I'm doing with the shock doctrine is I'm, 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 te- I'm covering the same ground, but I'm telling the story differently. Uh, mm. Because in the official story, you don't hear about the importance of shocks and crises. What you hear is that free markets and free people go hand in hand, that this ideology spread throughout the world because people wanted it, because yeah. they wanted their Reaganomics with their Big Macs after the Berlin Wall fell. <laughs> so you know, this is the official story. Um, when Milton Friedman died in 2006, there was a, there was a retelling of that official history. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the, the merging of the idea of this radical vision of free markets and democracy, which is the, 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 the two-for-one deal uh, right. that, that has been sold to us um, by people like Francis Fukuyama. Uh, and, um, and so I'm, I'm telling the same the same history, the same chapter, uh, um, but I emphasize key, different key dates. Mo- many people, mm-hmm. when they tell this history, they begin with Thatcher and Reagan. I begin with Pinochet right. um, because that's really when it began. Um, and because we've been, it, it is a victor's history, the one that we get. And so it's been cleansed of the, you know, the unflattering details, yes. like the fact that it started under a military dictatorship. Yeah, it's interesting because I know with Friedman that uh, I'd seen a documentary on him, and he had argued that he was a mere economic advisor to Pinochet. Well, Friedman was a mere economic advisor. He, right. he, he went to Chile in 1975, and he, um, he, he, he provided some very specific economic advice uh, to Pinochet. Pinochet took that advice. There's a correspondence between the two of them um, that is now public. Right. Uh, um, but I, Friedman's influence went far beyond just that trip. Uh, he, the real influence, and this is why it, you know it's much bigger than one one man, has to do with the influence of the sh- of, of, of the, the people Latin Americans call the Chicago Boys. Mm. The Chicago Boys are a group of of economists who were trained at the University of Chicago under Friedman and his colleagues in the 1950s and 60s. There were roughly a hundred Chilean Chicago Boys, Chileans who came to the University of Chicago. Oh, the reason really? why this is bigger than Friedman is that it wasn't Friedman's idea to bring them there. This was a program of the U.S. government, of the, of the State Department, right. and it was developed in the 1950s because there was a great deal of concern um, at the State Department that Latin America was moving to the left, much as there's a great deal of concern at the State Department today right. that Latin America is moving to the left. Right. So there was, there was this discussion of what to do about the pink economists uh, right. in Latin America. This is a phrase that was used by USAID's, the head of USAID's Chile office. Mm-hmm. And through, conver- through co- conversations with the head of University of Chicago's economics department, they came up with this idea. Now, what's important to understand is that in the 1950s, University of Chicago, under the the, the economics department, um, at this point was was a, was a, a quite a, a marginal radical school of, represented a quite a marginal radical school of thought. Okay. Um, the U.S. At, at this stage was fully in the grips of Keynesianism. So the, the influence in the U.S. Um, over policy was uh, was held by Keynesian institutions like Harvard and Yale at that point. Right, because Friedman was, was an outsider. Friedman was an outsider. He described yeah. himself and his colleagues as this, you know, ba- sort of band of, of marginal, you know, voices in the wilderness, really, in, mm. in this phase. But precisely because they had this radical vision of the world in which the market should control every aspect of life, um, you know, that they were advocating. He was advocating privatizing the post office, national parks. This was, these were crazy ideas in the 1950s. Right. Um, but, but, but the idea of what was called the Chile Project, uh, the idea of bringing Latin American students, their tuition paid for by the U.S. government and later by the Ford Foundation, hmm. was that by training this group of students uh, under these very radical right-wing economists, that they would be a counterpoint to the socialists in Latin America, and, and there would be a battle of ideas. Yeah. Right. So the influence of, of the University of Chicago and the ins- influence of Friedman under the juntas of Latin America, mm-hmm. um, and, and hundreds of students went through these, these programs. It extended from Chile to Argentina, Mexico, Brazil. Um, the influence was uh, went well beyond Friedman. It was that it was that a generation of politicians was trained in this radical ideology. They went on to be 
finance ministers, heads of the central banks. They went on to work for the IMF and the World Bank, okay. and they were really the proselytizers of this ideology. Okay, and it's interesting when you talk about Iraq in the book because you describe essentially the shock doctrine as a three-step process. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could describe that process for us. Well, I, in, in the book I talk about three distinct forms of shock which reinforce each other right. um, in a sort of cycle a circle of shock, if you will. Yeah. Um, the first shock is the shock to countries. Uh, it's the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in Iraq, it was called shock and awe. It was the military invasion. It was an invasion strategy based on um, a theory that you needed to put the entire population of Iraq into this state of shock and awe to convince them of the futility of resistance. If you read the shock and awe manual, it, it spells it out. Yeah. Um, so that was the first shock. The second shock, uh, was 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 Paul Bremer arriving in Baghdad uh, um, in May of 2003 in his uh, trademark uh, Brooks Brothers suits and and his, boots. And his uh, Timberland boots, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and declaring Iraq open for business. Mm. Now it's you know it's, it's so much has ha has changed and Iraq says spiraling in chaos today that one can forget that or that that first summer of frantic lawmaking under Paul Bremer, uh, but mm. this was a period actually of relative stability in Iraq mm -hmm. and Paul Bre and and this is where you actually can see very clearly what the Bush post-war plan was you know we often hear they didn't have a plan well they had a plan and but it didn't necessarily work it didn't work right. yeah it backfired badly yeah but there certainly was a plan and Paul Bremer implemented that plan with great enthusiasm the plan was to turn Iraq into a model free market economy and when they were finished, then they, then they were going to have elections. Um, and it's wow. very important to get the order right. Yeah. Because Iraqis actually wanted to, they had this crazy idea that they should have elections first, and then they should have a democratic government decide what the economic policies that would Imagine govern their country that. should be. Yes, yeah. you know, very backwards people. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, but of course, you know, Bremer and Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld and Cheney knew better. Um, and they, their plan was to push through uh, and Bremer wrote 100 laws, edicts. They were very, very radical, I and mean, they often talked about them as if they were just sort of technocratic little housekeeping measures. Hmm. Um, but in fact, the, 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 the uh, economists described it as the wish list for foreign investors. Uh, foreign companies were allowed 100% ownership over Iraqi assets. They were allowed to take 100% of their profits out. But these hmm. are laws that are unheard of in the region, which is actually very protected economically. Hmm. Uh, but you know, these were radical laws anywhere in the world. They were, they were, there were laws that Bremer pushed through that the Republican Party has been trying to impose in the United States and never been able to, like a flat tax. Right. They, 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 Iraq got a 50 percent flat tax in this period so that was the economic shock yeah. that's the economic shock therapy program and it was based on this theory that Iraqis would be so disoriented um, and, and reeling from the shock and awe invasion ba focused on daily concerns like the fact that say they didn't have electricity or water um, and uh, th that they wouldn't be able to resist these economic shocks uh, mm -hmm. Richard Armitage who I quote in the book former undersecretary of state under Powell yeah. said that the theory was that Iraqis would be easily marshaled from point A to point B. Now, of course, that didn't happen. Right. And Iraqis did organize in that first summer, and they demanded elections. Um, in, in fact, there were there was a series of local elections. There were protests almost daily outside the green zone. People wanted their jobs back. Um, they were, and, and they, they were uh, very against, particularly the foreign investment law. The Iraqi business people organized, opposed this law, um, and right. as, the, that, that mostly nonviolent resistance turned into the armed resistance. Then there was the emergence of the third shock that right, I talk about in the say. book, and that is the non metaphorical shocks to bodies, the, the shock literal, of torture. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. torture is always an enforcement tool. You know, I think we, we talk about torture in a very narrow way in this country. Um, you know, does it work? Does it get reliable information? But the real meaning of torture is that it's a tool of state terror. It's a way to gain control over a country that, it, that, that, that you can't govern with consent. If you yeah. can't govern a country with consent, with the consent of the people, then you have to govern it through fear. And a classic way of governing through fear is the use of torture. Uh, because it says to a people, and Saddam used it to great effect. Absolutely. Uh, you crossed me and this is what happens to you. Well, torture um, is, is a tactic of state terror. Yeah. And we talk about torture 
uh, as if it's only about getting information. And we forget that torture is primarily about transmitting information, transmitting information to the broader society. There are two goals of torture. There's what happens between the interrogator and the prisoner in the cell, and there is what the use of torture says to a society, right? right? What, what it transmits, and what it transmits is cross us and anything can happen to you, right? And that mm -hmm. message you know, has been transmitted by the Bush administration again and again. I mean, think about Cheney going on Meet the Press and going, well, we're going to have to spend some time in the shadows. Friedman wrote this in 1982. He said, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. That there is the manifesto of what I call disaster capitalism. The taking advantage of a moment of crisis, of extreme cataclysmic change, of confusion, and using it to loot the public sphere. He, um, I, I want to give a few, a few examples of the application of this shock doctrine, this crisis theory because it gives an alternative view of how these ideas triumphed. We're at a moment right now where we are seeing this same ideology imposed with ever escalating levels of violence. The reconstruction of Lebanon after the Israeli attack is used as an opportunity by the World Bank and the IMF to demand that they privatize water and electricity. Uh, the reconstruction of Iraq that, that is used as a cover to push through an oil law that will continue to loot Iraq for the next 30 years. Um, you know, we owe, the world owes Iraq reparations. That's probably not going to happen. But on top of denying Iraqis reparations, they are, the only chance of that country rebuilding itself is if it maintains control over its oil revenue, and that is what is, uh, is, what is being taken advantage of in the current crisis in Iraq, this so-called civil war. I think we don't have the analysis to understand the level of violence that is being used to impose neoliberalism, whether it's taking advantage of a crisis like Katrina, or Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon. We don't have the language to talk about it because we have accepted this fairy tale version of history. We have allowed the right to cleanse the violence from their own triumphs. So now we're surprised, we're taken off guard by the level of violence that we see today. So I want to give four examples of the, the shocks that get left out of the stories the non fairy tale version of this story. The first is Chile under Pinochet, which is a story that all of you know, I'm sure. The second is the way in which Margaret Thatcher used the Falklands War to push through her radical privatization program. The third is the way Deng Xiaoping used the Tiananmen Square massacre to push through radical neoliberalism in China. And the fourth, is how Yeltsin used a violent attack on the Russian parliament and the suspension of democracy in that country uh, in order to impose economic shock therapy. Now these are four examples, there are many, many more. Um, but I think that if we, if we look at this history, our present makes sense. This talk is about becoming shock resistant. And I believe that, that knowing this history, is what makes us shock resistant. If we look at places that are becoming shock resistant, like Latin America, it's because they understand where the current attacks fit into a 500 year history of taking advantage of crisis, of violent imposition of capitalism.
And that is what makes social movements strong, having our eyes wide open, not false optimism. So in Chile, you had um, three distinct shocks. This was really the first place where Milton Friedman and the so-called Chicago Boys were able to impose their textbook ideas. They weren't able to do it in the United States. Nixon, uh, when, when he was elected, Milton Friedman was convinced he was going to get the chance to bring his, what he called a liberal revolution, a free market revolution to the United States, but it didn't work because Americans didn't want it. And Nixon ended up becoming, in Milton Friedman's words, the most socialist president the United States has had in the post-war period because he imposed wage and price controls. Um, he did it to win an election because these policies were not compatible with democracy. And when he did it, he was, as, he was almost as popular as FDR. He won 60% of the popular vote, and then he was impeached. Um, but it was because of, of, as he said, we're all Keynesians now. So Nixon threw Friedman a bone, and that bone was Chile. They had a laboratory where they were able to test these ideas. Um, they also had a group of roughly 100 Chilean students who had studied at the University of Chicago. You know, Seth was talking earlier about the importance of training young people um, and, 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 and uh, having a a, a new generation of public intellectuals. Well, let me tell you, they knew this at the Chicago School in 1957 when they created what they called the Chile Project to take on the so-called pink economists of Latin America. And they trained up this generation and they went home to wage a battle of ideas and they lost miserably. They lost miserably as the 1973 election of Salvador Allende showed. They couldn't win an, a battle of ideas. All three major political parties in the 1973 election in Chile supported nationalizing the copper mines. They were off the political map. They came back with tanks. They, they rode in on Pinochet's tanks. The second day of the coup, every general, every member of the junta had a document that they called the brick because it was so thick. And what it was, was a neoliberal economic program that was basically a reiteration of Milton Friedman's capitalism and freedom. It was everything from privatizing social security uh, to, to charter schools, uh, to tax cuts, to free trade. And they did it all. They did it so fast that Milton Friedman came up with a new name for it. He called it shock treatment. That was the second shock. The first shock was the coup. And while the country was still reeling, they were hit with the second shock, the shock treatment. And just to make sure that people stayed in line, there was a third shock, and that shock was torture. That was the bodily shocks inflicted on the bodies of labor organizers, of soup kitchen workers, of members of left-wing political parties. It was a warning to the whole culture. We are seeing the same triple shock formula imposed again. We in Iraq, we had a war that called itself shock and awe, that was designed specifically as a psychological program as well as a military program. It was followed immediately by the most ambitious economic shock therapy program ever attempted in any country. That was Paul Bremer. When he wrote in, he bragged that Baghdad was still burning when he passed the flat tax law, 15% flat tax. And one of his undersecretaries said, uh, the whole Republican uh, Party in the United States is jealous of your tax law. This was a great comfort to Iraqis. And when, and when people resisted, they met with that third shock. They met with that third shock um, and continue to, to this day. Now, we, many of us do know this history, but we sort of, it's kind of blamed on all oh, those you know, Latin America is a violent continent. That's why it happened there. there. There are human rights abuses, but it didn't have anything to do with the economic program. And we heard this narrative uh, when Pinochet died this past year. Terrible man, human rights abuser, but did wonders for the economy. There was no connection made between the two. And of course, the movement 
that had claimed Chile at the time as a laboratory quickly tried to forget this embarrassing incident, much as Hollywood stars tried to forget their early soap opera work. Um, Latin America was an embarrassing glitch in the era of Thatcher and Reagan, the democratic, the, the, the moment where the, where, the mo where the movement was imposed in Western democracies. Well, Thatcher's case is interesting. It's interesting because for her first three years in office, she really wasn't able to impose any of these policies. She tried to. Uh, she tried to. Um, she became so unpopular that she was, she was less popular than any leader had ever been in the history of opinion polling. In 1982, she had an approval rating of 25 percent, less than Bush, and her political party had an approval rating of 18 percent, and they were a year away from elections, not looking good for Th the Thatcher revolution. And they hadn't done anything. They hadn't done any of the major privatizations. They hadn't busted any of the unions. And they were heading straight for defeat. What happened? Well, in Argentina, uh, they put the flag in the Falkland Islands. And, uh, and actually, it was the Argentine Junta that was trying to save their own project by doing this. Borges at the time described the dispute as two bald men fighting over a comb. Um, because nobody really wanted those islands. Um, but the islands were useful to both regimes. The Junta in Argentina thought they could use, use anti-imperialist sentiment to save their regime. And Thatcher thought that she could have a last blast for British Empire and save her neoliberal project, and it worked. Not since September 11th's renovation of George W. Bush has a political leader been so renovated by war. She went from 25 to 59 percent in the polls, sailed to victory in the 1983 elections, and at that point busted the, the, the minor strikes, busted the blue-collar unions, and pushed through the most radical privatization spree ever attempted in a Western democracy. Was that peace and democracy? Thatcher relied on these shocks, on the exploitation of crisis. Uh, to push through policies that were clearly rejected by the majority of people. One of the interesting things in my, in my research has been looking at some of these incidents um, in, about the transitions that communist countries have made to so-called free market ideology, um, and looking at the way they were covered in the Western press at the time, versus the stories that are now, the narratives that are now emerging. Um, in these countries. Now, Tiananmen, the Tiananmen Square massacre was reported in the Western press as exclusively students uh, who wanted democracy up against a communist regime that wanted to protect its own power and was willing to use enormous force. Another narrative is emerging from China's new left, self-described new left which is that, in fact, it was not only students. That these were protests against, lo and behold, Milton Friedman prescribed shock therapy program. Um, that it was overwhelmingly workers um, who were p opposed to the, uh, the deregulation of their wages, the lifting of, of, of price controls. Um, and the, the widening disparity. People wanted democracy, but they wanted democracy for a reason. They wanted democracy to oversee the economic transformation so that it could be widely shared and not simply be a transfer of wealth from the party elite to a new corporate oligarchy. When those protests threatened that economic project, then the tanks came in, then the tanks rolled. In and, and it was the shock of Tiananmen that created the workforce in China that was, has been so profitable to so many corporations. The raw terror of a state that is willing to go to such lengths to roll over their students, their workers, that was a message. And it was the same message that workers got in Latin America with their shocks. That's how neoliberalism came to China. Now, in Russia, which was the next great uh, success story for the movement, um, Gorbachev brought democracy in before he brought in the free market reforms. He didn't want neoliberalism. He wanted what he described as 
a, a new kind of socialism, a, a socialist beacon to the world. He wanted something on the model of Scandinavian social democracy. Well, he was, he was shut down by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and, and, and rapidly ousted by Yeltsin. He had a team of economists who called themselves the Chicago Boys um, because they had learned everything they knew by reading pirated copies of uh, Capitalism and Freedom and Free to Choose um, during the communist years. They weren't actually Chicago Boys, they were sort of knockoff Chicago Boys, but that's fitting for Russia because it has a very big black market. So, um, What happened in in Russia was the same thing that happened in China, which is that the democratic reforms came into head-on collision with the economic reforms. So contrary to what we were being told at the time by Francis Fukuyama, that the history had ended, that democracy in the political sphere and free markets in the economic sphere were the end of the ideological evolution of mankind, I believe was his phrase. Um, they were in fact in direct conflict because Russia's elected parliament voted uh, to impeach Yeltsin uh, and to stop what they called this, uh, this, this economic adventurism. 67% of Russians told pollsters that they believed the best way to transform their economy was workers' cooperatives. They wanted to transform their centrally organized uh, uh, factories into co-ops. 80% of Russians told pollsters they believed it was the role of government to maintain full employment. They didn't have democratic support for any of these reforms. Well, when that became clear, that's when Yeltsin sent in the tanks, once again, just like in China. Um, thousands of riot police and soldiers descended on the Russian parliament. It burned. It used to be called the White House. It was renamed the Black House. Around 200 people were killed. Thousands were arrested. Um, and then there was this, a, a period of really dictatorial rule, and they called it the, um, the Pinochet option, actually. What's, one of the things that was most interesting to me in doing this research was reading these quotes from Western economists who were in Moscow, working for the World Bank, working for the IMF. They were, they were so excited after this coup which was reported in the Western press as Yeltsin standing up for democracy against anti-government forces as if the parliament was not the government, which is the equivalent of the American president bombing Congress. Um, this is a quote from Newsweek. Um, it said, Western economists uh, working closely with the government <clears throat> say, with parliament out of the way, this is a great time for reform, which I love. <laughs> democracy out of the way, it's fantastic. And this is a continuation of the quote, the economists around here were pretty depressed. Democracy, depressing. Now we're working day and night. Indeed, there is nothing quite as cheering as a coup. Uh, Charles Blitzer, the World Bank chief economist for Russia, told the Wall Street Journal, I've never had so much fun in my life. Now, neoliberalism doesn't always need this level of violence in order to impose its agenda. I don't think it's about where it's being imposed. I think it's about the level of opposition that this agenda encounters. When it encounters mobilized, militant movements, that's when the tanks roll. That's when the army tanks roll. When the movements are less organized, the think tanks do the work. By think tanks, I mean the people who are paid to think by the makers of tanks. I thought of that one for Seth. Um, in Canada, we experienced our own version of this crisis opportunism. Now, Yeltsin's coup is 1993. I want to read you a quote from John Williamson. John Williamson, well, his claim to fame is simple. He's the man who invented the Washington Consensus. He thought of that name and also explained what it meant. He is, uh, what do you know, he works for a think tank in Washington um, and uh, that is closely aligned with the World Bank and the IMF. Um, and he has this uncanny knack for verbalizing the subconscious of capitalism. That's why I love him. Um, 
He said this in 1993, the, the year of, of Yeltsin's coup. He noticed something in his research, which is that not only did it seem that it was important for there to be a crisis in order to impose what he called deep reform, which meant the Washington Consensus. But he noticed that the only cases where the Washington Consensus had been imposed were countries that were facing some kind of profound crisis. So he was musing out loud at one of these gatherings where world, you know, central bank presidents from Poland and Argentina and ex-finance ministers tend to gather. This is in Washington, D.C. in January of 1993. He said, one will have to ask whether it could conceivably make sense to think of deliberately provoking a crisis so as to remove the political logjam to reform. For example, it has sometimes been suggested in Brazil that it would be worthwhile stoking up a hyperinflation so as to scare anyone into accepting those changes. Presumably, no one with historical foresight would have advocated in the mid-1930s that Germany or Japan go to war in order to get the benefits of the supergrowth that followed their defeat. But could a lesser crisis have served the same function? Is it possible to conceive of a pseudo-crisis that could serve the same positive function without the cost of a real crisis? Now, that was the month that Canada hit the debt wall. 1993, covers of the Globe and Mail, specials on CTV, we were about to go broke, if you will recall. Now, Linda McQuaig, the wonderful investigative journalist and great supporter of the CCPA, in her book, Shooting the Hippo, she goes into, and I'm sure many of you have read it, but it's interesting to think about in this context. She tells this extraordinary story about going to, the th talking about how, how the, the think tanks in Canada, particularly the C.D. Howe Institute and the BCNI, were using the threat that Canada's credit rating was going to be downgraded and nobody would want to invest in our country because we were going to hit the debt wall. So even though things seemed fine, under the surface, apocalypse awaited. And the only way out was for us to cut our social programs. Um, Linda went to, to New York, and she went to, to uh, Standard & Poor's. And she met with the guy whose job it was to, oh, sorry, she went to Moody's, and she met with the guy whose job it was to issue Canada's credit rating. And he told her this absolutely extraordinary story about um, how heavily he was getting lobbied by Bay Street to downgrade Canada's credit rating. He thought Canada's economy was doing great, and he kept issuing these AAA credit ratings, and he kept getting phone calls of bankers screaming in his ear, and he said he'd never experienced anything like this because usually countries would call and ask to have a higher credit rating and scream at him because they'd given them a B. But Canada, he said, it was it, 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 Canadians usually, if anything, disparage their country far more than foreigners do. Now, that isn't just, oh, you know, we Canadians, we're always insulting ourselves. It's not that. <laughs> it's that the business community in this country knew that they needed a pseudo crisis. They created it, which is really the function of these think, ta think tanks, not just intellectual disaster preparedness, um, but creating the crisis to themselves, not waiting for them to happen, creating them, and then taking advantage of them. And of course, we know what happened in the 1995 budget in this country. Here's the bad news. <laughs> these tactics work, obviously. Why do they work? For the same reason it works to pick someone's pocket at a car accident. We can't defend ourselves in moments of crisis. This is the lowest of the low. When we are disoriented, that's precisely why crises are so appealing. People are pushed out of the way. Democracy is messy. It's easy to remake New Orleans school systems when the people are gone. These tactics work. That's the bad news. Here's the scary news. They're not working as well as they used to, so the disasters that they're taking advantage of are getting bigger. 
That's what we see with this transition from taking advantage of debt crises, currency shocks, to taking advantage of massive environmental disasters and wars. But the good news is that shock is a temporary state. By its very nature, what shock is, is the moment that we go into when information comes in that we can no longer process. We go into a kind of freeze frame, right? We go into a sort of suspended animation. We don't have enough information to process what's happening. We are off guard, we're scrambled. But we get oriented. Shock can't last. By its very nature, it's a temporary state. And shock wears off. And shock is wearing off. This movement, this counter-revolution began in Latin America 35 years ago. And I believe that that's why we are seeing the most radical resistance and real alternatives to neoliberalism coming out of Latin America, not because Latin Americans are inherently more radical than the rest of the world. They've had more time to come out of shock. They never won the battle of ideas. That's the great myth, that's the great fairy tale. All they did was kick us when we were down. They didn't win the intellectual debate. That means that we never stopped believing that we could build a more just, egalitarian society. We never stopped believing it. So all these ideas that were blasted out of the way by crisis, by disasters, by tanks, by torture, were just under the surface and they're bubbling up again. They're bubbling back up again. It's happening in Latin America, you see it in Bolivia, you see it in Venezuela, you see it in Chile, where all of this began, where there were just huge student strikes, a new generation of young people who aren't afraid, and are demanding a universal education system, and are rebelling against the charter school system that they were the laboratory rats for. They want a more just system. China, this labor market that was created in terror so profitably. There were 26,000 labor strikes and protests in China last year. Why? Because shock wears off. It is a temporary state. We, it's easy to be discouraged by how much more funding the right-wing think tanks have. You know, Seth said the Fraser Institute, they've got six million dollars. Well, here's the thing. They need that money. They need that money, and they need Can West, and they need CTV, and they need Belt. They need it because they have a really tough intellectual job. Their job, well, I'll quote Milton Friedman in a letter to Augusto Pinochet in 1975. He said, the major error, in my opinion, is to believe it's possible to do good with other people's money. Their job is to convince people that by trying to do good, you do bad. And by being, doing bad, by pursuing your most selfish desires, you do good. Crazy, crazy talk. Very expensive to convince people of something so deeply counterintuitive. It is much cheaper, much cheaper, to convince people that to do good is good. Bad, bad. Because we know this. We already know. You know, it's interesting, when I was preparing for this speech, I was sort of thinking a lot about think tanks, and, 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 and the CCPA is not a think tank. Some people say it's a left-wing think tank. It's not. It's a public policy research institute. It's longer, but it's important. It's an important distinction. Why? Because tanks are for creatures in captivity. Uh, they swim in circles. The food is free. The water is foul. So let the Freedmanites have their billion-dollar think tanks. I'd rather be with the CCPA, roaming wild and free <laughs> on the untamed intellectual plains. Can you see it? You, me, the CCPA, and all of those rebellious, renationalized Mongolian yaks. Thank you.